Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Yvonne Ortiz. I am the Training and Resource Development Specialist at the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And welcome to this webinar session titled Expanding Safety and Support Services for Survivors of Domestic Violence and Their Pets. I want to welcome our presenters. Today we are going to be uh, hearing from Ali Phillips. She's the founder of Sheltering Animals and Families Together Safety. She's also the director of the National Center for Prosecution of Animal Abuse and the National District Attorney's Association. We also have Mary Lou Randur uh, with Senior Advisor Animal Cruelty Programs and Training with the Animal Welfare Institute and Nancy Blaney, Senior Policy Advisor at the Animal Welfare Institute also. We're going to start our webinar with Mary Lou and Nancy. Uh, ladies, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, and um, both Nancy and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to do this. And uh, we have done a number of joint projects with our, uh, the National Research Center for Domestic Violence. And we hope we can do even more. So um, as you know, uh, this is going to be focusing on domestic violence survivors and um, how we can protect their pets, and by protecting their pets, how we can better protect the domestic violence survivors. And I'm going to briefly talk, and then Nancy's going to talk about uh, the law. And I'm going to just start off with the, the first slide that gives a very brief summary of some of the research that uh, substantiates uh, very well this link between domestic violence and animal abuse. So if we can have the next slide. Uh, one of the better studies that has been done, um, because it was done over a seven year period and, and included 11 metropolitan areas, wanted to look at what factors were associated with who would begin to batter, which is not the same as lethality, obviously. It's you know, uh, uh, ahead of all that, and the idea being what could predict, you know, how could you predict and intervene. So when the study was done, what they found was that there were four factors that predicted who was more likely to begin uh, initiate battery, and one of those factors was animal abuse. So again, this study underlines the importance of asking questions about animal abuse so you can see what else is going uh, on in the home and we can make earlier interventions. And the next slide. And again, there have been a number of studies. Some have done at the national level. Some are done at state surveys. Um, and over the last 20 years, they have multiplied. So to give you a kind of general overview of some of the results, uh, in one national survey, 71% of the battered women reported that their pets had been threatened, harmed, or killed by their partners. Uh, the other thing about uh, domestic violence and pet abuse is that batterers who abuse the pets usually offer, usually display more forms of violence and they demonstrate greater use of controlling behavior than batterers do not. So pet abuse is not only an indicator of domestic violence, but kind of uh, perhaps the severity uh, of the domestic violence itself. And then this next uh, statistic that's up there, bullet point three, points to the need to call attention to the link between pets and domestic violence because um, it makes sense when you think about it, but up to 48% of victims of domestic violence report they delay seeking safety out of concern for their pet's welfare. And, and they're right to be concerned, of course, uh, but what we need to do for them is to provide a safe place for them and their pets. And the number of domestic violence victims who delay leaving increases if their pets have already been abused. Um, and then the last statistic, again, showing the kind of um, the, how common this is, this overlap between pet abuse and domestic violence. Another national survey, 80% of domestic violence shelters, uh, the women there indicated that they, that the, the shelter uh, 
administrators indicated that women that came to their facilities spoke of incidents of pet abuse. So this, that's a very kind of brief overview, and Nancy's now going to go over uh, some of the legal issues related to this and what's been done, and then we'll go to resources. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mary Lou. As you can see, especially from that third study, uh, how many women uh, domestic violence survivors uh, delay leaving a situation because of fear for their pets. So what we need to do is have more and better laws and resources to address that. One of those is the ability to include pets in protection orders. And the fact that we have 29 states now, plus D.C. and Puerto Rico, that specifically allow such inclusion is really amazing when you consider that this really just got started in 2005. So it's only been 10 years since the need to include pets in protection orders really started to kind of move to the forefront. And the first state to do that was Maine. Last year, four states came on board with that. So it is really picking up steam. We've included, there's a little bit of a back and forth over just how many states that includes. The 29th, we've included Florida because Florida um, defines domestic violence in such a way that includes pet abuse. And what it does is if a, a pet has been abused or there's the threat of abuse, that is grounds for reasonably fearing that one is in imminent danger. And that is grounds for um, acquiring a protection order. So we've included Florida among those states that allow for inclusion, uh, but the other 28 actually specifically say pets can be included in protection orders. So they're a little separate category. So uh, the next slide, as you can see, uh, is a, a graphic of a map. It's a map that just shows um, what states allow the inclusion and which states do not yet. So be sure that we are working on those others. Um, so we're, we're um, definitely working to try to make it ac across the country. The next slide shows that there are two ways that animals can be included in protection orders. Um, one is you have the specific law that says, uh, that either says uh, this is stay away, the um, person named is to stay away from the pet, and or it can also uh, award custody to the, uh, the um, person getting the, the protection order. It can also, pets can also be included uh, when uh, animal abuse is an underlying uh, offense that forms the factual basis for an order. So that's those areas where uh, animal abuse is a, a component of domestic violence. And uh, I apologize, we've got to update that number for you. We actually have, I think it's nine states. That's Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Maine, uh, uh, New Hampshire, uh, Nebraska, Nevada, Tennessee, and Arkansas all include animal cruelty in their criminal definition of uh, domestic violence. Florida, as I mentioned, includes it if, uh, as a basis for reasonably fearing one is in danger. And Pennsylvania uh, provides uh, animal abuse as a grounds for temporarily ordering the relinquishment of firearms. So that's a real sort of outlier, um, but another way to get animals included. Now, what happens if your state does not have a special TRO law for pets, and that's the subject of the next slide, or doesn't have um, that underlying definition? So in that case, uh, if we can move to the next slide. Um, in that case, pets can also be included when um, there as property. Now this is something that we all kind of shy away from, uh, you know, trying to get away from that definition of pets as property. But they can be protected under a, uh, a restraining order in the same way that one can get uh, possession of one's home, of one's furniture, uh, and a pet ownership can also be awarded that way too. If we could move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, now, this is a lot of information. We've got 50 states that are all doing something a little bit different. And uh, we would, uh, the next slide will, sh will show um, what we have done to respond to that, which is uh, we actually had a, an attorney from Hogan Lovells uh, come to us and say, you know what, 
I think it'd be great if we did a manual for the, the region here, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, that shows how to use pet protection orders. She works in the domestic violence area as well, helping um, uh, victims. And she said, there's not a lot of knowledge about how this works. We thought this was great. So uh, through their help, we put together the first manual that covers the, the metropolitan area here. And we thought, heck, if it's good enough for our area, it's good enough for everybody. So with their help and the help of uh, law students at University of Pennsylvania, George Washington University and independent uh, lawyers, we are working on those manuals. We now have five available on our website. Uh, you can find our website um, on the first slide, so uh, you just can take a look at that. So those manuals go, uh, will deal with whether it's a uh, pet protection law specifically or you have to you know, kind of fit a square peg in a round hole uh, when you have to use some other means for doing that. But we, are, uh, we have about 20 to 30 in the works right now, so uh, we're hoping that this will be a, a very valuable resource to advocates and attorneys. Uh, you can find an up-to-date listing um, on the next slide. The uh, Animal and Legal Historical Center at the Michigan State University of College of Law uh, keeps these things updated, so that's a good place to go for that information. So that's kind of, uh, you know, on the, on the legal side, what's out there now. But things do need to improve, and uh, as Ali will, will point out uh, very effectively, uh, you know, the need for co-housing of uh, pets and domestic violence victims. So uh, on the next slide, you'll see that there is a federal law, a federal legislation now, the Pet and Women's Safety Act. Uh, there we go. Um, that does a number of things. One is it does include uh, acts of violence against an individual's pet under interstate stalking and violation of protection order laws. So that will put this on a federal basis as well. It also provides for compensating for victims' losses, including uh, veterinary bills if the pet is indeed harmed. Then the big thing is it directs the Department of Agriculture in consultation with some other departments to uh, come up with a grant program that would help uh, agencies carry out programs uh, that would help provide housing for domestic violence survivors and their pets. Now, this can, will cover a lot of things, it's, uh, whether they have plans for co-housing, whether they have a foster program that needs some help, whether they have work with somebody who has a separate shelter. So under this bill, uh, funds would be available for e expanding the, um, uh, the options available within jurisdictions for this purpose. But in the meantime, um, as you'll see from the next slide, we've got some things out there. And what uh, Animal Welfare Institute has done is took several years to call through all of the agencies and programs that are out there to find those that do provide some assistance with finding housing for domestic violence survivors and their companion animals. And we have put this into a zip code searchable database. So what you do have are the co-housing programs such as Ali has been so adept at, uh, at uh, bringing, bringing, um, bringing, into, bringing to life as well as those other programs where they will pro provide assistance with finding housing, even if it's not on site, whether it's at a shelter, with a vet, foster care. So the main thing is that survivors know now that there is help, because what we heard so much of was they don't bring it up because they just assume there is no help. And while it's not sufficient, there is at least some out there. And, uh, as a matter of fact, we have partnered now with the National Domestic Violence Hotline, which is the next slide. Uh, I'm talking faster than my slides are moving. <laughs> um, and as a result of that, uh, as a result of that, um, we are getting about 200 hits a month uh, on our database. 
So as you can see from this slide, the entities that are included include uh, sheltering services, they have relationships with those that provide sheltering uh, or other uh, assistance, financial, perhaps financial assistance with finding uh, housing elsewhere. So if we could get to the next slide. Thank you. And you can see uh, the number of entries, uh, which is uh, quite, quite large, um, not as large as it needs to be, but more than I think uh, most people are aware of. And then, as I mentioned, we're partnering with the hotline, so that's been very, um, very fruitful. So I'm going to turn this back over to Mary Lou to um, kind of talk about going back to that other uh, study that was mentioned where you have 85% of the shelters mentioning that um, their clients coming in talk about harm to the pets, but the trouble is fewer than half of those shelters are asking questions. If we could have the next slide. Hi, it's Mary Lou again, and as Nancy said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of asking questions. Um, I'm a psychologist by training and spent some time in private practice many years ago, and whenever a new kind of um, social issue arose in people's awareness, whether it was substance abuse, uh, child abuse, the, the message is always the same to uh, anybody dealing with uh, other people who are seeking help, and that is you have to ask the question to get the answer. So as Nancy said, there was a, two, two surveys done. One was a national survey of domestic violence shelters, and I think now there are about 1,900 domestic violence shelters in the U.S., and about 800 responded. And they were asked, among other things, do you ask questions about whether a person has a pet and whether they need some safety plan for the pet? And fewer than half said yes. Um, and then again, we conducted our own survey of safe haven for pets of domestic violence victims. So these were already places that have been set up to deal with the problem, but yet again, uh, only half of those asked the question about whether or not you had a, the person had a pet and whether that pet needed a, some safety plan. And so obviously our um, drumbeat is ask the question um, so we'll, we can help more women and their, their pets. So if I can have the next slide. And uh, it isn't rocket science. I mean, you, you can just simply say, do you have a pet? Uh, you could ask the question, has your abuser ever harmed or threatened to harm your pet? Remembering back to the previous research, I cited that the uh, more violent domestic violence batters also tend to be more violent toward the pet. That, that can give you an indication of you know, kind of the level of seriousness. And then do you have a safe place for your pet? Um, and then the question, do you want uh, a court order to make sure that your abuser stays away from you and your pet? And uh, Nancy referred to that earlier, uh, how we have these state manuals now where it walks anybody who wants to help a domestic violence uh, victim uh, kind of walks them through the process of adding a pet to a protection order or getting that protection even if the state doesn't have a particular um, stipulation. And then the next slide. Um, this is, uh, you know, obviously domestic violence uh, victims often come with children and so it's a whole family that is affected by violence and so this is the other um, thing that we try to do at AWI is to enlarge the frame of reference um, and so when we're talking about family violence, you're really thinking about domestic violence and child abuse and animal abuse because uh, understandably is they occur um, alongside one another and so it's important to recognize that so we can intervene. There are a lot of pets in households and I'm sure people who are listening to this, raise your hand if you have a pet. <laughs> I have a pet. Um, and this, to show how kind of intrinsically important it is, uh, how pets are important in our lives, there was one study, and these studies are also so sweet because they're kind of the honesty of children, but one 
One study asked uh, children uh, to name the 10 most important individuals in their lives, and 7- and 10-year-old children asked this question, always listed two pets on average in addition to, I hope, their parents and friends. <laughs> and then in another study um, of 5-year-olds, 45% responded, my pet, when they asked, who do you turn to when you're feeling sad, angry, happy, or, or wanting to share a secret? And I, I think all of us kind of know this intuitively, but it's also important to recognize because of the effect of animal abuse in that whole dynamic of family violence. And if we could have the next slide. Um, being exposed, and more and more people are understanding this, it's not just being a direct recipient of, of violence, but it's also witnessing violence that can have a really deleterious effect on young brains and mature ones as well. Um, children exposed to domestic violence, uh, and this has been sadly documented in many different ways, uh, suffer more emotional behavioral problems. They enjoy less social cognitive competence and exhibit more health problems than children not exposed. And while in a way this isn't surprising, it's really kind of, um, to me, very kind of shattering to think how extensive the damage can be done to a child to be in the midst of, of family violence. And in fact, it has a genetic or a physiological effect. And what they've discovered now is that there are something called telomeres, which are the ends of the DNA uh, that we have in our bodies, and that people who have suffered um, violence, children who are exposed to violence, have shorter telomeres than other people similar to their age. And the reason this is important is it increases the risk, as you can see, of a number of uh, negative factors, heart disease, obesity, cognitive decline, mental illness, poor mental health uh, outcomes in adults, and also earlier death. Um, also not um, a surprise if you think about it and the role of with what watching and learning, social learning, is that children exposed to domestic violence are more likely to have committed animal cruelty. So. Um, just in general, children who have been exposed to domestic violence are at greater risk. Um, they're at greater risk, uh, whether it's a single episode or um, multiple episodes. Although obviously multiple are more dangerous. I, and I just uh, jump in here uh, to mention that this is becoming recognized too, kind of just on the cutting edge as pet protection orders was 10 years ago. Um, with state laws recognizing this. Uh, so far we had two states only, Arkansas and Oregon, that had significantly higher penalties when animal cruelty was committed in front of a child. So AWI looked at this and thought, this is a, you know, right ground for making some inroads. So we did get passed in Illinois this year, passed unanimously in both chambers, so that in and of itself is, uh, you know, quite, <laughs> quite astonishing. But they now have a law that the governor should be signing shortly uh, that will increase penalties when uh, animal cruelty is committed in front of a child. So just to add to the uh, consequences for uh, animal abuse, uh, particularly when, as, as Mary Lou pointed out so well, uh, the, the terrible consequences it can have when children are involved, because not only are they witnesses, but sometimes they're forced to be participants as well. Um, next. Oh, uh, we are at the next slide. Um, so again, it isn't rocket science, but just to kind of be curious with the child to ask questions and ask them, have you or your family ever had any pets? Oh, what happened to them? Um, for example, they may say, if, if somebody responded, well, we, yeah, we had We've had seven dogs, and you ask, well, what happened to them? They kind of maybe disappeared, or it's uncertain what happened to them, and it's been over a short period of time. You may wonder about the family dynamics. Um, ask them if they have pets now, uh, if they've ever lost a pet they cared about, and I'm not going to read every question uh, because you can see them, and you can have, and you will have your own. But the um, 
the invitation is is to be curious with children about pets and the role of pets in their lives, not just to find out the harm that may have befallen them, but also to learn what their attachments are and their strengths are. Next slide. Um, this is for those of you who would like some specific references to some of the research studies um, that we cited earlier. I we laid this out for you if you want to. Um, look for any of those, or you could contact me, and I do have some of the PDFs of those studies. So at this point, um, we want to uh, thank everybody again, and also encourage people to check on the link that we have posted on the first slide, because uh, at the AWI website, we have many practical resources, including obviously the zip code, searchable, uh, database of, domestic, of safe havens for pets of domestic violence victims, as well as the manuals by state for domestic violence advocates, and then other resources as well directly related to the topic of pets and domestic violence. And we might also point out we did a technical uh, yeah. uh, guidance with uh, NRCDV, so that can be found on their website as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Lou and Nancy. This is valuable information. I want to remind our participants that you will be receiving both PowerPoint presentations as well as some resources that our presenter, uh, presenters want to share with you guys. And this is it's going to come uh, in the form of an email after we finish our presentation. And also, if you have any questions, comments, feel free to use our chat our public chat, and uh, we have Casey there, and anything, anything that you want to ask us, a comment, please feel free to share. And now I want to uh, invite Ali Phillips, founder of uh, Sheltering Animals and Families Together Safety, to join us. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. It's so great to be here. Uh, if you can go to the next slide then. So the safety program uh, is Right now, it's the first and it's the only global program that is working directly hands-on with domestic violence shelters so that they can welcome families that have pets. Um, and I'm not, I, I do have a couple of slides with some of the research studies, but Mary Lou and Nancy did a really great job, um, you know, highlighting, you know, what is now a significant body of research that we're seeing. And what this is, is this particular program is something that I created back in the mid-1990s when I was a frontline prosecutor in Michigan. And it, it was because I was very concerned about what I was seeing in the courtroom every day. And, you know, this, this was, of course, during a time it was um, when a lot of the domestic violence protocols were changing, and so we were no longer allowing you know, uh, victims of domestic violence to come into court and dismiss a case. So, you know, we were very proactive in our domestic violence cases, working very proactively with victims. Um, but I had so many that would come to me in court and say, I've gone home and I went home to protect my pets. And so that really prompted me to start thinking about this because, you know, back in the mid-90s, this was pretty much unheard of. I mean, I think at that time, maybe only one or two shelters in the country that I know of were actually doing something like this. So over the years, I created this protocol, and it's now a written guidebook uh, that is actually part of your materials as part of this webinar. But what the safety program does is it recognizes that pets are part of the family, and it encourages the human-animal bond because when you know, whether it's a domestic violence situation or maybe a weather disaster or some other tragedy, when we can be with our pets, when we can evacuate with them, it actually helps with our healing. And so this program really encourages that human-animal bond, particularly for children. It provides a way for families to leave these homes sooner so that they can get to safety so that they can get out of the homes with their kids and with their pets. And so it really does acknowledge the link. Next slide, please. 
And so, like what Nancy and Mary Lou were talking about, you know, this is the link. It's where we see the intersection of child abuse, animal abuse, domestic violence, and elder abuse. Next slide, please. And so I'm just going to go through these next couple of slides very quickly because um, you've already gotten some great information on this. But pets are part of the family. So, you know, when I talk to, uh, you know, sheltering professionals, you know, I, I like to convey that two-thirds of your community has pets. Two-thirds of the homes that you're dealing with have a pet. So when you can start creating programs within your shelters to welcome families with pets, you are able to serve two-thirds of your community. It's a vast majority of your community. And you know, so this is really important because pets really are considered part of the family. Next slide, please. And you know, when we look at what pets do, I mean, they provide comfort and support and security. I mean, you can see on the slide there all the things that the research has told us that pets do. But for those of you who are listening who have pets, you know what your pets do and how they help you feel. And so if you are in a violent situation, you can imagine how beneficial having your pet with you when you are escaping would be so helpful. Next slide, please. And so th there's one particular study that really caught my eye um, that was just from a couple of years ago. And, and it really spoke to how, um, you know, as a sheltering professional, it's really important to understand the dynamics between how animals are bu abused, how women and children are abused, and to really understand this in the work that you're doing. Next slide. And so this particular study, what it did, it was a very, very small sample. It was, it was only 19 women um, at a domestic violence shelter in the Midwest, and it was a shelter that did not accept pets. But what they were doing was they were trying to determine if the bond was determinative of the type of abuse, um, when the women were seeking shelter, you know, the type of recovery that they went through. And 12 of the 19 women still had pets. Seven of, seven of the pets had been harmed. Twelve of them had been threatened. And what they found was that the pets, um, or that the women who had strong bonds to the pets, the abusers were using control tactics to threaten the pets, kind of like what Mary was talking about, that you know, the stronger the bond, the stronger the threat. And, but the pets were helping the women in recovery. Well, what they really found when they asked the women was that they wanted to be asked about the pets at intake. They wanted their veterinarians to offer safe housing, and they were actually critical of the shelter for not providing options, either on-site or off-site. So these women really felt that they didn't have any control over their decision. And knowing the dynamics of domestic violence, this is one area where you can give them that control back by welcoming pets on site. So these were a couple of, or next slide please, I'm sorry. So these were a couple of quotes of what survivors in the survey actually said. I mean, look at this. I stayed alive over a fish. When I had nothing else, I had a fish. It kept me going. Another survivor said, if I had known about you know, a program like safety ahead of time, that would have saved my animals through the years that I've lost because of my abuser. The guilt that some of these women take with them and that the children take with them can be alleviated by having a program like this. Next slide, please. And actually, I'm going to ask you to um, go through the next couple of slides, because I know Mary Lou and Nancy did a real good job with this. So if you could actually scroll through. Um, let's go through five or six slides to the slide that says harsh reality. And so really the harsh reality of a lot of this is that the abusers will exploit or, the, or they will target the pets to get silence or compliance from the family members um, to really just maintain this overall terror and fright um, you know, eliminating a source of comfort by eliminating that, that family pet. And so if the families cannot leave with their pets, they may feel forced to return home. And that's what I saw in the court system. Women were going back home. And what it does is it just reinforces that there's no safe place and it keeps the power and control going because if I can kill the dog, 
I can kill you. And that's the ultimate message. Next slide, please. So the solution of really getting these families out of the home, especially families that do not want to be separated from their pet, is the safety program. So the first guidebook was officially launched in February of 2008. Um, I'm in the process of updating the current um, guidebook. Um, but let's go to the next slide. And let me give you some statistics. Um, currently, I have 93 shelters that are housing pets on site. And this includes shelters in the US. Overwhelmingly, they're in the US. But I do have a couple in Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. So the program covers 37 states, and there's 11 more shelters in progress. My goal by the end of the year, and it's a lofty goal, is to get one of these safety shelters in every state. Because as you know, these women often don't have the means or the money to take themselves across state lines to get to a safety shelter. So it's really important to have one of these in every state. Next slide, please. So I often get the question, why don't all shelters accept pets? And these questions are coming from people who are not in the sheltering world. And you know, so these are things that I discuss in the safety guidebook. I mean, that guidebook has everything that you need to know. Um, and you know, I know that there's concerns about allergies. And I know that there's concerns about how are you going to fund this? How are you going to set it up? And how are you going to sustain it? I know that there's concerns about dog bites and cat scratches and families leaving and not taking their pets with them. And what if there is a custody battle and the abuser shows up and demands return of the animal? All of these are addressed in the safety manual. Next slide, please. And so my friend Rita Garza, um, who for years was the senior vice president over at the Urban Resource Institute in New York City, she she's such a big promoter of this program and actually really got it going in, in the shelter where she worked. But she, she admits, you know, sheltering in the domestic violence world is complicated and complex, but she said at the same point, it's unacceptable to not accept pets because pets are part of the family. Two-thirds of homes have them. Next slide, please. So setting up a safety program is really about assessing your needs. You know, how it's really finding out of the families that are calling you and calling your hotline, do they have pets? How many have pets? It's really figuring out, do you have two-thirds of your community with pets? So before you even start, do an assessment. You know, Have your hotline workers ask every family, do you have pets? How many pets do you have? Tell me, are your pets safe? And if you don't have options at that time for housing pets, ask, you know, ask the callers, do you have friends or family that can take your pets, pets temporarily? And this is a really good way to assess your community and find out what the need is. Because once you have that need, you know, and you can just do this for a week or you can do it for a month, then you can take those numbers and you can go to funders funders in your community, you know, even people who want to support you, and say, look, we did a survey for a week or a month or what have you, and these are how many families that called in with pets that we could not help. People will support that. So it's important to get your hotline workers really prepared with resources. So the website for the safety program, which is animalsandfamilies.net, getting them the, the website directly to the Animal Welfare Institute's um, Safe Havens page where the families can search by zip code. Having that right there in the hotline room is important. But it's also having your hotline workers ask the families, have you delayed getting to safety because of your pet? And gathering that information. But you'll also want to consult with your staff because you know, it, there's nothing more heartbreaking than to have a very compassionate, you know, eager person set up one of these programs, but the entire staff doesn't buy into it. And then if that passionate person, you know, leaves or gets promoted, the program fails. So it's about getting buy-in throughout the whole um, staff. All right, next slide, please. So it's about garnering support. 
with the shelter staff, going to your board of directors, going to community leaders. So it could be, you know, your mayor, you know, county commissioners, whoever your community leaders are. Going to your animal protection community, the veterinary community, and I'm going to talk about in particular those two communities um, as being important partners uh, in just a few slides. But it's really about working as a team so that this doesn't end up feeling like this is such a monstrous project to work on because it doesn't have to be. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go through briefly how to establish the safety program. Um, and then I really want to spend some time, I want to show you photos of what the shelters are doing because everyone's doing something different. So I think visually, <clears throat> excuse me, if you can see what the shelters are doing, that's so important. So the main thing is to establish a program director. So finding someone who is really passionate about this and someone who is willing to lead the program. So this is someone who is going to, um, you know, work, work with, with me, with funders, and really figure out how you want to set this up. And so this is all about working as a multidisciplinary team. It's about really notifying all the agencies that you work with. So law enforcement, prosecutors, the court system. You know, I know here in Michigan we have um, the personal protection order offices um, pretty much in every county in the state. And there are court workers who help the families get their personal protection orders. So it's important to have those people knowledgeable that you are becoming a pet-friendly shelter. And so it's really getting that information out. And then it's deciding what type of pets do you want to take. Overwhelmingly, the shelters all take cats and dogs. But there are shelters that will take reptiles, you know, so they'll take iguanas. You know, maybe a, a child has a pet tarantula in a little, you know, um, glass glass cage. Uh, there are some families that have pot-bellied pigs and goats and horses. I mean, there's, there's a wide variety of animals that we deem pets. And so it, it really depends on your community. And so it's figuring out what you are comfortable housing. And then it's figuring out what housing style is going to work best for your shelter. Because in all the work that I've done, all the shelters are very different. You all do things, you know, very uniquely for your resources in your community. So the safety program sets forth three options that really covers the whole gambit of things. So the first option is to put the pets right into the rooms with the families. So it's kind of like a hotel room. You know, you go on vacation, you have your dog with you, you just keep your dog in the hotel room. That particular option can be set up immediately. You could get off this webinar and say, we're going to put pets in the room, and you could start taking them as of 5 o'clock tonight. And it takes no money to do this because the pets are in the room. Now, I know some shelters that they provide crates that can go into the room so that when the families, you know, if they're gone during the day, if the kids are at school and the, um, you know, the adult um, survivor is working, then sometimes the shelters just ask that the pets be put in a crate while they're gone. Um, those sort of supplies, if you go to your local pet store or um, when I talk about working with animal protection groups, they often have them that they can donate. So this is an option that you can truly set up immediately for no cost. The second option is where you take a room in the shelter. It could be a spare office a utility room. It could be a garage that's properly um, heated, cooled, and ventilated, or it could be a basement. So it's physically within the walls of the shelter, and you create an indoor kennel. What this does, um, and this can really come into play if you are concerned about allergies. Um, because going back to option one, if you're concerned about allergies, if you have rooms that the family stay in where, you know, you have hard floor, so hardwood floor, linoleum, tile, it's really easy to clean up pet dander from, you know, hard floor. But I do know shelters that have carpeted rooms and they just say, we shampoo the carpets in between, 
whether they have pets or not. And some shelters designate some residential rooms as pet friendly and other ones are off limits to pets. So in option two, you really are confining any potential allergies to one location. And in that indoor kennel, you can put an air purifier in there. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can do. You know, but the thing with with pet allergies, I mean, I'm myself, I'm allergic to cats, but I have cats because I have hardwood floors and I have air purifiers and that works really great for me. Um, other people may be far more allergic. And so this could actually be a good option to isolate the animals in one room all the animals stay in crates because you're going to have animals from multiple families and you don't want them mingling and because um, they may not get along. But the families can go into that room. So in the middle of the night, if they're afraid or if they're sad, they can just walk down the hall, go into the indoor kennel, and see their pet. Now option three is if you really don't want the pets inside, if you don't have room to have them inside, and if you have room outdoors, you can create an outdoor shelter. And so I'm going to show you a lot of photos of really creative ways that the shelters have been creating outdoor kennels. You know, and this really does eliminate any concern about allergies. Um, but again, you would have to allow the families to have access. Um, you know, and you really want to make sure that it's safe and secure because especially if they're outdoors, even if you're in a confidential location, you don't want an abuser to somehow find where you are and break in and steal the animal, you know, as as in, you know, as part of the whole, you know, dynamics that have been going on with that family. So you'll want to think about security, you know, putting padlocks on, on the kennel door or the cages. Uh, some shelters have installed security cameras. Some shelters already have security cameras, and so that would really um, be beneficial for that area. But then you want to make sure that you have some basic materials and supplies on hand, you know, cat food, dog food, cat litter, dog leashes, just some basics. Because if the family is escaping, they may not have time to grab what is needed. Now when it comes to noise, you know, again, it's, it's about helping the other residents understand that, you know, there's families here that you know, escaped with their pets, and you know, their pets are like their kids. And so it's really helping them to understand, because some pets may bark, they may meow, they may have a bird that talks all the time. And what's interesting is, you know, the initial reaction would be, well, we're going to put those animals in the outdoor kennel so that they won't bother the residents. And what I've heard from multiple shelters is that when they actually put the animals in an outdoor kennel, they do talk a lot more. They bark, they meow a lot more because they're in a strange place. They don't know where their family is. But when you put them in the rooms, they tend to be quieter. So it's just something to think about um, if you're concerned about noise. Um, and then if you have objections from staff, it's just a good opportunity to talk to them about what the objection is because you find that maybe a staff member had a negative experience with an animal early on. Maybe they witnessed um, harm to a beloved family pet and that just kind of caused some trauma for them. So it's just a good opportunity to talk to them and, and to explain that this is a life-saving program that, you know, as a shelter we need to do everything possible to make our doors wide open for these families. And if that means taking in pets, I mean, you take in kids, right? You know, pets are, are sometimes called kids. They're called little fur children. So it's about making yourself acceptable to that and helping everyone understand. All right, next slide, please. And so three important criteria for this program is to first Set up a Memorandum of Understanding, an MOU, with a local animal shelter or a rescue group because in no way do I expect you to become animal experts. So what the animal partner can do is help you if a family has an excessive number of pets. Maybe they can take some into their care while you have others. They can help with noisy pets. They can help if there's large or exotic pets. You know, if somebody comes in with a horse or a pot-bellied pig or an iguana and you're not equipped to handle them, they are. Or if an animal comes in that is acting aggressively, 
the shelter may have an animal behaviorist that can come in and really help you determine is the dog aggressive or is the dog just scared because of what the dog went through? You know, is the dog just stressed out? So they're a great resource for helping you, you know, really set up. I mean, they could even answer questions about, you know, if you have any local ordinances on whether you need a shelter permit or anything like that. They know all that information. I also recommend that you partner with a veterinarian because just as soon as a dog comes in with a broken leg in the middle of the night, that is not when you go looking for a veterinarian. So it's finding one ahead of time, finding one who will partner with you to provide basic care. Um, and what I'm finding with a lot of the shelters is that the veterinarians are providing services at no cost. If they can come to you, whatever they can do on site is typically for no cost. So it's a general examination, maybe, you know, a flea treatment, um, you know, grooming, you know, things like that, giving vaccinations. If anything more extensive is needed, work out a deal where you pay, you know, a, a reduced price. Um, but you also want to work with the veterinarian about obtaining the, the vet records of all the pets that are coming in and getting them from the other veterinarians just so that the family has them so that you know whether the pets have been vaccinated and that sort of thing. Um, so it's really important to try to find a volunteer veterinarian. I find that veterinarians love this program. They want to be affiliated with this program. It's their way of giving back. So all you have to do is ask. Um, and your animal shelter partner, they may have a veterinarian on site who will do this for you. And then the third important criteria is to make sure that the families care for the pets. It's not your job to walk the dog, clean the litter box, clean the cage, or do any of that. It's a privilege for them to have their pet on site. The whole goal, like I said initially, is to maintain that human-animal bond, to maintain the normalcy of life. And that means scooping the litter box and brushing the dog. So they care for the pets. As part of this, the pets are to have no contact with anyone but the family. So even when they're walk, you know, walking a dog through to go outside, other residents, especially kids, should not be petting that dog or that cat. Because these animals, while they may look calm on the outside, they could be really stressed out from what they experienced and from being in, in a different location. And if a child comes running up to a dog or a cat, that's when you could have a dog bite or a cat scratch. So the families take care of the pets. No one interacts with the animals except maybe designated staff, um, especially if you're, you know, if you want to help out, you know, with really taking care of the animals. But no other resident really touches these animals, and that's important when I talk about insurance because I have found that insurance carriers, they want that guarantee. Next slide, please. So you need to also think about how long are the families going to stay with their pets? I mean, typically the pets stay as long as the families stay. I don't know any shelter that's charging a fee, um, you know, but you could certainly do that if you wanted to. You'll also need to think about you know, what if a family comes in and, you know, they do check in with a couple of dogs, but they also had a couple of other animals that had been killed. Um, maybe getting them some um, pet grief counseling. And so in the safety startup manual, I do have some resources on how you can find um, a counselor that can help with pet bereavement. And then you also want to think about when the family leaves the shelter. What if they leave and they go to the next level of housing that doesn't take pets? That's why it's important to think about this program all the way through your process, you know, to the initial emergency um, intake housing, to the, you know, the you know, transitional housing, to extended care housing, because if at any point in the process pets are not allowed, then what is the family going to do? I mean, the chances of them going back to the home are pretty high. So it's important that when they leave the shelter and they go to the next home that they can take their pets. If it's just a temporary housing situation where maybe for one or two weeks they have to go to another location, I know some shelters that will keep the pets on site just temporarily. 
Next slide, please. When it comes to fundraising, public awareness is your best way to raise money. You don't have to disclose where your shelter is, but just tell your community that you are now pet friendly. And if you are in one of the 13 states that doesn't have a safety shelter, you can really go public that you are the first safety shelter in, you know, New Hampshire or Maine or, you know, uh, you know, Idaho or wherever. So you can really raise the public awareness and people will donate. People love to donate to animals. And so, you know, even when you're partnering with your animal shelter, you know, partner, you're not going to be taking, you know, money away from them or their donors. You know, people love to donate for animals. So, you know, you're going to be tapping in to new donors. And what you're doing is you're actually providing a benefit to your animal shelter partner to make sure that those pets don't go into their care because they're often overcrowded. And it'd be a shame for an animal to be euthanized just because there's no room. So it's coordinating with your animal shelter partner to go to fundraisers, to have a booth, to raise awareness about the link between violence to animals and people and what you are doing. So on the screen, there's a photo of the giving tree that the um, Shelter for Women and Abused Children in Naples, Florida, they take around the community. Then they have little ornaments on them with things that you know the community members can buy and donate to the shelter and the tree brings in about three thousand dollars a year and for some shelters you won't even need that much in a year to run your program these are inexpensive programs next slide please the um, harbor house in orlando florida um, they have as you walk into their pet shelter um, a, a memory and a donation wall where people can buy a tile and the money goes to help support the shelter. People love to create, you know, long-lasting memorabilia with their pets on it. So you can even see on that, on that photo how many pets are on there. So that's a great fundraiser. Next slide, please. Now, although this is temporarily on hold for this year, it is going to come back next year. But for the last four years, I have held an event called National Safety Day. It's the first Saturday in October, and it's where either a shelter that is housing pets or a shelter that wants to house pets hosts a dog walk in your community. And through the dog walk, you can raise money to support your shelter to either build it or sustain it. It raises awareness about this issue. It brings the community together. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And so this is just one photo from Demopolis, Alabama, of the people that came out and supported their um, National Safety Day. And, and I hear from a lot of the shelters that they raise enough money in this one, you know, four to five hour event that sustains their pet housing for an entire year. So it's a really great program. It's going to be coming back in 2016. Next slide, please. And there are, uh, there are funding options out there to get you started. Red Rover is a company that I partner with, and they have two grants. They have the Safe Escape grant, and this is where they will respond to you very quickly if a family needs money for transportation or for boarding a pet or emergency veterinary care. Um, it's a grant for up to $500, and that must come through you, through a shelter. They also have a startup grant to build a safety shelter. Um, Banfield Charitable Trust has their pet advocacy grants. Um, the American Kennel Club has a humane fund. Um, the Veterinary Care Foundation and the American Veterinary Charitable Fund. That money goes through veterinarians who are assisting domestic violence survivors. So when you find your vet, you know, the veterinarian that you want to work with, tell them about those two foundations so that they can get signed up. Next slide, please. All right, and then just some other legal issues to think of. Um, you know, when you think about confidentiality, you certainly don't want, you know, a batterer calling up your shelter and saying, hey, is Fido there? You know, think of how you can include pets under your confidentiality, even if they may be temporarily stationed at an animal shelter. Um, certainly find out if the family has any court order, any pet protection order, any custody or ownership issues that are going on so that you're aware, so that you can help them 
get the records to show that they are truly the owner. When it comes to insurance and making sure you know, that you're covered um, in the event of any problem, when you follow the safety guidelines, the insurance companies have not had a problem with this at all. Some shelters may pay a little bit more in their insurance, but a lot of them are not paying anything more um, because, it's, um, because there's a lot of safety incorporated into the safety program. All right, um, and then you'll, you'll just want to really check in with residents and staff and, you know, modify the program, make it yours. You know, I can set forth the things to think about, but you really need to make sure that it works for you. Next slide, please. And another thing that I've really started adding into the safety program, and this is going to be added into the, um, into the manual shortly, is working on the healing of not only the people and the animals, uh, not only the people but the animals, because the people have the human-animal bond, but the animals also need some healing. So I've been working with shelters who are diffusing pet-safe essential oils. They're diffusing lavender. The Orlando shelter does that. Um, and it's a way to calm the animals. I mean, I know if you smell lavender, it's like, oh, that smells so good. It works with animals. Um, there are a lot of people in the healing community that would love to come in and volunteer and help. So reach out to them. You know, if you have, you know, yoga or meditation, um, you know, staff that engages in yoga or meditation, you know, offer, you know, for the residents to come and join in and have a, have a class. Or bring in therapy animals, especially since the pets on site are not going to be touched or handled by the other residents. Other shelters are bringing in therapy animals because the kids there, they know that there's animals there, but they can't touch them. This is a great way to really help them. So the Sojourner Shelter in Phoenix just started a therapy animal program. Harriet's House in um, Demopolis, Alabama has a therapy cat on site. So, you know, there's things that you can, you can do to really help with the healing. Next slide, please. So as part of your uh, materials for this webinar, you have the safety guide. It's got all the information that you need. It's got a lot of forms. And if you go to my website, you can download the Word version of all of those sample forms, and you can make them your own. All right, next slide, please. All right, this is going to go pretty fast because it's just a lot of photos, but I really want you to meet the shelters. So next slide, please. Um, I have two slides that show the option one housing and the shelters that are doing this. So this is where the animals go in to the residence rooms. And, and as you can see, I mean, initially some shelters say, we can't do this, we're too afraid of allergies. Well, these shelters are doing it. Feel free to call them or, you know, I can give you the contact information. Next slide, please. Because as you can see, there are more and more shelters that are bringing the pets indoors because some pets actually would not do well being separated. Cats don't do well. You know, small pocket pets may not do well. There's dogs that have separation anxiety. And if the animals have been abused, they really need their person. So these shelters, a lot of them actually have multiple forms of housing. So they have option one and maybe option three. So you can do more than one option. Next slide, please. So this is a photo of Victorville, California, the High Desert Domestic Violence Program. Um, they took two rooms and they built those um, fences on the back end of the rooms and you can see the little uh, doggy door there. Let's go to the next slide because you can see it a lot better in this one. And so these two rooms are pet friendly. The dogs or cats can go in and out. They have free access to do that. And the pets stay directly in the rooms with their families. Next slide, please. New York City, um, I, if New York City can do this with all their red tape and bureaucracy, this really can be done. Uh, this really took a long time to get, um, get going. It took about five years, um, but the Urban Resource Institute opened one shelter and they're in the process of, of opening a second that is friendly to their um, residents' pets. The pets go in the room, and because they're in the city, they don't have you know, big yards to build outdoor kennels or play areas for the dogs, but they built in this alley a play area for the dogs. 
and so that's a picture of what you can do. So it's really about you know, there is no limitation to what you can do. You can just be creative and do what works for your community. Next slide, please. So here are the shelters that are providing the option to indoor kennel. So this is putting the pets in a spare room, a utility room, a garage, a basement, you know, anything like that. Next slide, please. So these are just the, the other shelters that are doing the same option. Let's go to the next slide. So this is, this is a great quote um, from uh, Nikki DeSoto with the uh, Serenity House in Arkansas. And this is a new pet-friendly shelter, and she says uh, the kennel's been a true success. It's been occupied every day since it was completed. So that tells you the need is out there. Even though you may think, you know, we really don't have people calling us asking us to take pets. They're not calling you because they know you don't take pets. So put it on your website. Let them know, hey, we're, we're going to do this. We'll be able to take your pets. All of a sudden, you're going to be sh having a lot of people show up with pets. And that's what happened with Serenity. Next slide, please. Here's a photo of Lake County Resource Center in Kelsey, California. They are a new um, safety program shelter. And you see they just took a room. And that is a cage that they can put a cat or a small dog or a rabbit or you know any other small pet. Next slide, please. Bailey, Colorado has the Mountain Peace Shelter. And they took a garage. It's a heated garage. Um, and they have cat cages in there you know, for small pets, small dogs. And then they have an outdoor dog run area. So um, you can see the dog kennels on the right, and then they do have an outdoor area. Next slide, please. Naples, Florida has had their shelter open for almost 13 years. Um, they took a utility room. They put six large dog crates in the corner that had been donated and they were fully operational. It's that simple. You, this can be a very inexpensive option and you can set up very quickly when you work with your animal partner. So outside the door in the photo on the left, that goes to the grassy area that's the photo on the right. And so the families can go out there with their pets and enjoy the grass and uh, get a little sunshine and some exercise. Uh, next slide, please. Sarasota, Florida has um, a safe place and they converted their garage into a kennel. So you can see, I mean, you can actually see in the photo on the left, they got some residents in there. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be fancy. These pets just want to be safe, and they want to be with their families. They don't need luxurious accommodations. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so option three, I have four slides that show you the number of shelters that have a backyard kennel. So I'm going to try to go through these slowly so that you can read all of the states and all of the shelters that are doing this. And like I said, a lot of the shelters have multiple options. Next slide, please. So there you see Idaho, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Michigan, Missouri, Nevada. And I'm going to show you photos of some of these. Let's go to the next slide. Again, more states. And then let's go to the next slide. Rounding out with Wyoming there. All right, next slide, please. So this is what I don't want to happen to you. So three years ago, there was a really um, public domestic violence situation. A woman was being beaten with a hammer. And her dog, Hank, was laying over her. He's a, a um, uh, uh, Doberman Retriever, and he was laying over her and taking a lot of the blows from the hammer. If that wasn't enough, the abuser then threw them out a second story window. And in spite of all of that, they survived. Um, she dragged both of them to the Rose Brooks uh, Family Violence Shelter in Kansas City, Missouri. And at the time, Rose Brooks was not able to accept pets. But this woman was, I love it, it actually says in the article, she was defiant and she got in. And as a result of her courage and her dog's heroism, next slide please, 
that's what they built. And that story hit national news. And I don't think it should take even a local story, let alone a national news story, for you to set up a program like this. But that's what happened with them. Let's go to the next slide. This is what it looks like inside the shelter. And again, it's, it's beautiful. It doesn't have to be luxurious. It's beautiful. It's clean. It's safe. You can already see in the photos on the left, they have cats in those cages. On the right, that's the dog kennel, and it's where they store the food. Next slide, please. And this is the plaque that they put up in, at, their, um, at their pet um, shelter. And they dedicated it to her courage and Hank's heroism in really saving her. Because if she had died, he most certainly would have died. He saved her so that then she could turn around and save him. Next slide, please. Um, here's the Kenai, Alaska, uh, Least Shore Center. And again, it doesn't have to be luxurious, but that works for them. That is a perfect housing system for the dogs that come into their care. Uh, okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, Sojourner in Phoenix, Arizona is one of the newest shelters. And not only do they have the cages for the animals inside, but they have some outside for the dogs, and they have a nice little play area indoors for the pets. And PetSmart did support them in their efforts doing this. Next slide, please. Here's Kelseyville, California. Again, it's a new safety shelter with the Lake County Resource Center. The top photo showed what the backyard looked like before they did anything, and then it showed what they did afterwards. So again, you don't need a huge area. You can take a small area, lay a slab of cement, put a kennel on it, either in, you know, a kennel with fencing, or you can get one of those prefabricated sheds at any home improvement store. Just make sure you outfit it with proper ventilation, cooling, and heating, depending on your climate, and you are all set. Next slide, please. There's Fort Collins, Colorado, the Crossroads Shelter. So they have um, the outdoor shelter, not only the shed, but they have um, you know, a, a cage there. Um, they have also indoor cages in the basement for small pets that just need to come inside the shelter. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, the uh, indoor uh, in their basement. That's what their cages look like. Next slide, please. Here is Clay County, Florida, the Quigley House for their dogs. They put them outdoors. They're underneath a canopy, so they're protected from the sun and the weather elements. And each cage has a little dog house in it so that if the dogs need to go, out, go inside, um, they, can, they can do that. Next slide. The same shelter built a cat house on their property. Um, so it's a climate-controlled cat facility. I love the murals on there. I think it just looks very cute. And you can see all the cages in there and how the cats or rabbits or guinea pigs or hamsters or birds, you know, all the small pets can go in there. Next slide, please. Here is Orlando, Florida. Um, oh, it shouldn't say in progress. They are fully implemented now. So this is Harbor House. Um, I did have a chance to visit them when they were building and visited them when they opened. And they have a really large facility, but even though that looks huge and you may be thinking, gosh, we can't do that, we can't afford that, half of it is a, um, a donation center for furniture and supplies so that if the families need anything, they can get things. Um, and then the other half is the pet center. So next slide, please. So this is what Harbor House, um, the Pause for Peace kennel looks like. On the left, they have screened-in porch areas where the families can take their pets and go enjoy some fresh air. In the center, they have the dog cages. And this is sh the shelter that is diffusing lavender essential oils to calm the dogs. And on the right, there's their cat cages. Next, shel ne uh, next shelter. <laughs> next slide, please. Here is Greenhouse 17 in Lexington, uh, Kentucky. You know, they built. Uh, a, a shelter right on the premises, and you can see the photo on the right. Um, each room, it looks like a little glass cage there, and you can actually go in and spend time with your pet. Next slide. 
Uh, if you really want to have a multi-million dollar, multi-year capital campaign, then you need to talk to Las Vegas. The Shade Tree Shelter for Women opened the Noah's Animal House in 2007. They have 16 cat cages, 15 dog kennels, six of which are indoor-outdoor, and they, because of the capacity and what they needed, this is what they needed to build. Um, so, you know, again, you've seen all different from just having a dog house in the backyard to now a multi-million dollar facility. Next slide, please. Uh, the Aware Shelter in Hermitage, Pennsylvania, they worked with the Eagle Scouts to build this particular shelter in their backyard. So when you go out to service organizations like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Eagle Scouts, they need to do projects to earn badges. So you can go to them and ask them for help, and that's what AWARE did. Next slide, please. And so this is a, a statement from um, the AWARE shelter and what they did to raise money to not only build but sustain their program. So they reached out to civic organizations. They gave presentations about what they were doing. They did fundraisers, you know, candy bar sales, Zumba classes, pizza sales. They had a local church adopt them, and they did a, a pet drive for dishes and beds and animal toys. So it's just, like I said at the beginning, it's just telling your community and reaching out. Because you can certainly go and get a grant to set up, but if you ha have not reached out to your community and created those partnerships and let people know that you're there, you're going to have trouble sustaining it. So I'm a big believer in getting out there day one and just telling the community what you're doing. Next slide. Here is Torrentum, Pennsylvania. This is the Alley Kiske, uh shelter. And again, you can see, you're going to see the popularity in some of the, the photos where you have the shelter and then you actually have the dog run area connected right to it. And a lot of this is for safety reasons because especially if you have kids out in the backyard, that makes sure that the dogs can play and the kids are safe. Next slide. Meg's house in Greenwood, South Carolina. Again, you, you know, you kind of see a popular theme with connecting the uh, dog run area fencing uh, directly to the shelter. Next slide. Uh, Born, Texas, the Kendall County Women's Shelter uh, built, you know, a pretty sizable shelter. And you can see in the top photo they have a little dog run fenced in area. And inside they have the dog runs and they have the, the smaller uh, cat cages. Next slide. This is a great statement that I got from uh, Christy Kitchens, who is uh, the director of the Little Grass Ranch. This is a shelter in Comfort, Texas that only accepts women who have horses. So if they have other pets, that's great, but they at least have to have a horse in order to uh, gain entry into the shelter. And it's because of their community and ha having a lot of horses that they did this. But she shared with me uh, the 17-year-old who had been abused by her parents, and she you know, ran for her life and made her way to Little Grass Ranch. And then after the fact, they had to go back and get her horses. Um, three of them were being starved. One had been beaten. The 20-year-old was not given proper medical care, um, but they were able to get the horses and bring them to Little Grass Ranch. Next slide, please. Uh, Brigham, Utah has the New Hope Crisis Center. Um, they told me that they spent zero dollars on the kennel because the Eagle Scouts donated it and built it. And then they received a grant from Petco for pet food. So that's how, that's how this can work. You can really get free stuff and free labor. You just have to ask for it. Next slide, please. Arlington, Virginia has the Doorways for Women and Families. And this is a shelter that I help um, set up. They were actually part of my pilot program. And I worked with them to get this set up. They just they had a big slab of cement in their background, backyard. They put a shed on it. They built the little... Um, fenced-in area, and uh, that's where they put the dogs. Next slide, please. Jackson, Wyoming. Uh, this, is, this is one of my superstar shelters because they implemented in six weeks. So this doesn't have to take years and years. They did it in six weeks. 
So they built the little outdoor shelter. They have the fenced-in area. And that dog on the right is the first dog that they took into their care. Next slide, please. So these are the shelters that are still in the process of implementing, I'm hoping that they're going to be up and running very soon. Next slide. And why I'm so passionate about this is because I get emails like this every single day. There's a mom, she has kids, or she's pregnant, and she's got an animal, and she doesn't know where to go. And it's really heartbreaking for me when I look at my list and I see that she is in a state that doesn't have a safety shelter. And when I ask her, can you cross over into the next state? Do you have the ability to drive six hours, eight hours, ten hours? Overwhelmingly, the answer is no. So this is why this is needed. Next slide. And then I get wonderful testimonials like this from safety shelters saying how valuable it is. I mean, look at this one. Within the first few days of our program, the program proved to play a key part in keeping families together and safe. I mean, immediately you're going to see results and because it's a life-saving program. Next slide, please. And so my vision going forward is not only to get one of these in every state, hopefully by the end of the year, that's a lofty goal, <laughs> Um, but I am in the process, uh, and I don't know how long this is going to take, because it was not what I intended, but I'm turning safety into a 501c3. Um, so it, it's because it's growing and it needs the proper attention, um, because it is expanding internationally. Um, it is expanding in this country. So, um, you know, I'm just going to keep educating and reaching out, and I'm available. I mean, if you want to do this, I'm available to get on the phone with you and talk it through and help you and answer all of your questions and even the same once you're fully implemented. Next slide, please. So here's another testimonial from the uh, Mount Graham Safe House in Safford, Arizona, where, you know, again, it's these pr this program makes it possible for families to leave. And going back to what Mary Lou was talking about, about when kids witness domestic violence and when they especially witness animal abuse, that, that is going to take some intervention. So it's important to get the families out before the children witness anything more. You know, because kids do what their parents do, right? I mean, if you, if you have kids and if you've ever said a bad word in front of your child and they replicated it and they said it over and over again at inappropriate times, I mean, kids replicate what they see in the home, so we need to get them out fast. Uh, next slide. And this is the last slide. So if you need any help, any assistance, any questions, there's my contact information. I am super happy to help you. And if you are in a state that does not have a safety program, please work with me, and I will work with you. All right, Yvonne, that's it. And look, it looks like we have a little time left over for questions. Definitely. I'm excited. I wanted to read to you. I know, Ali, that you cannot see, but Norma has been sharing. Uh, there was a question that just seen one of our staff asked, uh, what ideas have these animal houses and kennels given you? And what questions have it raised? Great question. And Norma responded, this is a shout out to Norma, that she's going to share uh, her, the materials with the shelter staff, that it would be great for the uh, for the pets to stay with with the survivors, so that's that's wonderful. I have a question, and I want maybe the participants want to know how can they join or get involved in National Safety Day for 2016. Oh, just send me an email. Okay, great. Just send me an e email. Yes, and you know you could certainly do it this year. Um, it's just I'm not going to have the resources to. I like to send materials, and I know. Um, uh, the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence has sent materials to the participating safety shelters. And so we don't have those materials this year. But if you want to have a dog walk, I'll send you the materials on how to do it. It's really not that difficult. But it will be back up and organized with materials. Hopefully I'll have dog leashes to send. Um, and that will be up and running in 2016. But mark your calendar. It's always the first Saturday in October. And so you can just email me, and I can send you that information. 
And that would be a great start for BVAM. That's wonderful. Uh, and this is just a personal question. I don't know if anybody has a question like this, but when we usually think about sheltering pets, we think about cats and dogs, and you mentioned horses, but in your experience, tell me about other uh, large animals that, ha that shelters uh, have been able to, to house. Yes, yeah, so, you know, shelters that are in a more rural or farm area have probably more property. I mean, you saw some of the shelters where they actually mm -hmm. built, I mean, they, lo they look like large garages. I mean, they're big shelters, and so they had a lot of land. So they were able to bring the animals on site. But at the same point, a lot of shelters just create, you know, when I talked about having a memorandum of understanding with an animal partner, Find a rescue group that works with livestock or farm animals, you know, horses. You know, a lot of even animal shelters can take a horse, a pot-bellied pig. And so it's having that partnership so that you can take in the family, but an animal that is beyond your care can go to your animal partner. Wonderful. And uh, I have a question for Mary Lou and Nancy, if you could unmute your, your line. Sure. We're here. We're here. You're yeah, there, great. Uh, how can programs get involved with uh, the mapping project? If they have the Safe Heavens Map Mapping Project, if they have a program that is starting uh, to shelter pets, how can they get in contact with you guys? Just let us know. Um, you can email either Nancy or me, and it's marylou at awionline.org. And first, I would recommend also to just check out the different, there are over, there are 1,400 listings in our national registry. And uh, check out your state or nearby states and see which ones are listed. If you see something we should add, let us know. And uh, if you want any help in connecting to any of them that are listed, let us know. But yes, there are sh uh, shelters out there um, who uh, look on our map and see that we're not see that they're not listed? We will be happy to put them on whenever we run across a new one, you know, like through Alley or through Red Rover or something like that. If we see one mentioned in, a, in an article, we always go into our map and check and make sure they're on there. So it's a constant process. And I think Mary Lou, you've been talking too about we're going to go back. This is obviously always a work in progress, and go back and make sure all of the ones that are on there are still functioning uh, as we thought they were, um, or if any have you know discontinued services or are not uh, providing services anymore. So it's it's always a, it constantly in a state of being updated. But also, as Nancy mentioned earlier, but thanks to our partnership with the National Domestic Violence Hotline. You know, up to 200 people are going to the uh, Safe Havens directory, and they're not just, in, you know, it's not curiosity that's sending them there. They've called a hotline. They need help. So up to 200 families are getting help every month, which is very satisfying to, to know about. Now we'd like more to be able to get help. Of course. Thank you so much. And I will, we are almost running out of time, but I want to give you a couple of, you know, minutes to give any closing remarks, and let's start with Ali. Any thoughts? If this intrigues you and if you think you can do this, please contact me. Um, if, you know, if you need help in trying to explain this to your, you know, your director or a board of director, I'm happy to get on the phone on a conference call with everybody around the table and really talk you know, specifics for how this will work in your shelter. So, I mean, I really hope you see um, between all three of us talking about this that, that this saves lives. And so please reach out to me. I'm really happy to help you through this. Uh, Allie, we did have a quick dual question here. What is the process for an organization and a program to get involved with National Safety Day? And um, you had mentioned that modifying a program to make it yours is important. Is there other activities you can do for Safety Day other than dog walking, or is that um, the main activity that you help? On. No, you, you can absolutely make it yours. Um, the Little Grass Ranch that I talked about that welcomes women's w women with horses, they do pony rides. 
for the kids rather than a dog walk because they focus on horses. Um, and a lot of the shelters, because it's in October, they do a pet Halloween costume dress up and they do a contest and they have face painters there and, you know, clowns and, you know, it's whatever you want to make it. You can make it in, you can even include it into a bigger event that you have and just incorporate the animal part of it. So, yeah, you can absolutely make it what you want. Just email me and I can, I can send you information. Great. Thank you, Ali. Uh, how about uh, Nancy and Mary Lou, do you have any final thoughts? A quick last word from us is uh, highlight three things. The manuals that we have, um, keep checking back. We, uh, we have five now. We're going to be putting more up by the end of the year for advocates and attorneys. You know, use those pet protection orders. The map, go, whoever needs it, go to it. If there's something missing, let us know and ask questions. Uh, for anybody out there who's a shelter or anyone else who is helping uh, d domestic violence survivors, be sure you're asking questions of them uh, to assess, you know, if they have companion animals and, and what their needs are. Because obviously, as, as we pointed out, as Ali pointed out, they, they want to be asked, they want to, have, they, they want to find the help. Thank you so much. On behalf of the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, I want to thank Mary Lou, Nancy, and Ali for, for joining us today. The information that the three of you share, it's invaluable. Uh, I'm a pet lover, and I know that a lot of us are pet lovers, and this is just really close to our hearts. So thank you so much. Uh, please, everybody else that participated in the webinar, look for our follow-up email. We're going to be sharing with you the PowerPoint presentations, uh, the safety manual, and other resources. Look for Thank it. You. Thank you for joining us today.